this time I'm going to have folks to help and share with us. How many of you come to church with an attitude of expectation? Or do you come to church just because that's what you do on Sunday? We should come to church with the attitude expecting that God is going to do something. He's going to speak to our hearts. He's going to give us something new, something fresh. He's going to revive our souls and our spirits. And I believe that that's going to happen this morning. Notice if you come and share with us. Thank you, Pastor Dave. And, uh, just curious. Right. Or Madam Pastor, as we say in Haiti. So, so, thank you for those words. And sorry, Claudel's not here. And I'm not going to sing. Because right? it would not do me good. That would annihilate your expectations. Charles, trust me. However, my mama said I could sing. That's all I needed to know. So, it's so an honor to be here uh, with you, and it was kind of last minute, Pastor Dave, thank you for just uh, allowing me to come and share in your service today, and the reason I was late was I didn't sleep in, I was at the Baptist Church doing Sunday school, okay, so I come running in here, and uh, now last year we did about eight churches over the weekend, started here at 2 o'clock and had event here, and then uh, by noon the next day, we had spoken, I don't know, seven or eight. It was pretty amazing. So this year, it's only two. It's like I get a break. Actually, I get to spend more time with you. I know the first time that we came uh, to Ortonville was when Claudel was here. And by the way, Claudel is a worship pastor at a church in Lawton, Oklahoma, and doing incredible. Uh, he took the job, and uh, the church was running one service. The pastor had been pastoring at that church for a long time. And now the church is running three services. I got a feeling Claudel just rung the bell in that community. I, I miss it. I mean, nobody wants to see the white guy from Haiti. They want to see the black guy. So it's like, where is Claudel? It's, uh, yeah, but I remember the first time we came, uh, I met Kristen and John, and they'd come on a vision trip. And we came here and shared in the churches kind of that first time the same way we did last year. And uh, so we had spoken over at the Catholic Church, and I might have hit another church before that. Then we came to the Assembly of God Church when you guys were at the other location. And so, you know, Claudio and I both hit there, and he sang, and I, I was a little more fired up. And we walked out of the building, and, and Krista said, wow, you were a little different in the Assembly of God Church. And I said, I'm an Assembly of God. That's why. <laughs> I get it here. So this is home. Uh, so that's, uh, I pastored, and I've been everything you can be in an Assembly of God church, from youth pastor to cleaning the church and carrying the tables to being lead pastor and executive pastor and until I went to work for Mission of Hope. And so, uh, anyway, uh, whether, I'm just going to be at home, if that's okay. I, we shared the video, and uh, so it gave a little bit of who we are. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking about you know, that as far as the pieces that we are, but... It's in 2014, last year, I just want to share some, some statistics that, uh, that, that happened. In our church advancement program, we now work within 11 villages where we work directly with the local churches in those 11 villages. Now we've trained more, but in the 11 villages, we've been able to train on a regular basis 223 pastors. Uh, whether they pa actually pastor a church or not, they are in ministry within their village and we've seen 1,615 people come to Christ uh, in, in that time. And, so, and, and the fun thing about that is it's it's 90% of that is Haitian-led. Uh, North Americans come in, they share, they get to you know share Christ with others as well. Uh, our mobile clinics, they, they share Christ, and so people do come to Christ, but for the most part, it's all Haitian-led. And so of all the North Americans left, Mission of Hope would still move forward. Uh, education now, and school originally started with 260 some children. Today we have 6,100 students in our school program. And by the end of this next year, our goal is 10,000. The reason we, we want the numbers is because that's not only are the kids being educated, but they're hearing about God. And so it's all Christian based education. Our school, the only high school within our system, uh, now we're getting ready to build another one, but now we will have, this year in June, will be our seventh graduating class. 
And so um, we're pretty excited about that. In our nutrition program, we're doing 90,000 meals plus a day all across Haiti, and, and that number just keeps growing. In fact, uh, we, we work with almost 500 other partners in the area where we're taking food to them in their schools and their orphanages. But the fun part now, within the, the last two years of developing this whole nutrition process, most of the food is being shipped in from the U.S., but today we have 1,400 Haitian farmers working in this program. Now, not all those farmers are believers, but on any given meeting, everything flows through the local church. And so when we pull all the farmers together, or some of the farmers in this area and some over here, we bring them to the, one of the local churches, and we always share the gospel. And so little by little, those farmers are not only learning to farm better, they're learning about God, they're coming to Christ. And so uh, it's, it's an exciting program. We're, we're hoping someday that we'll raise all of the food and package all of it right there in the country of Haiti because it's providing a sustainable plant. And I think, I think this area knows a little bit about farming. I, just by driving in, I just got a feeling that might be the case. But uh, yeah. And I got pulled over by one of your best. So just right near a farm, beautiful farm. She let me off the hook, and I did not pull the eighty card. So, <laughs> and it was a, the, we have a housing program. Uh, our goal was to build five hundred, and now our finished product will be six hundred and thirty some homes that we'll build. We've already reached right at the five hundred mark. We have about one hundred and thirty to, to finish that up. There's a school, a little over five hundred students on that ground brand new church. It's been there now a couple of years, but just a beautiful facility that's been built, and uh, just a lot of light transformation happening right there. And, and if you remember when I shared before, those houses, each each house is on a 45 by 90 piece of land, so we don't only just give them a house, we give them a place where they can do a garden. Now, they're not actually farmers in the program, but they can actually look, they can plant some of their food. And uh, Dr. Brian and Krista, they've been there, and uh, and it's amazing to see the growth from the first time when the houses, all you saw were just like, you on the screen, it was just all colored, just the houses, and they're beautiful. But now you can't see the houses for the growth, so it's pretty amazing. So, um, anyway, and there's, uh, back at the table, there's some stuff, some brochures and things, and there's one way to uh, get involved if you're interested, whether it's individually or as a church. Uh, for $35 a month, you can sponsor a child. We have 1,700 children that still need to be sponsored within our initial 6,100 children. Now, those kids are still in school, so we don't just kick them out because they're not sponsored. Uh, we, we take the money right out of the general fund and, and help pay for that. Um, but if, if the moment, if we can get these 1,700, I'm not asking you to do 1,700 today. 1,400 would be fine. So, <laughs> One, I'll be excited. It takes everybody doing their part, whatever that part is. But um, then we can add another 4,000 children. We want to add them right now, but you know we just we just need to get these done. So then we can add 4,000 children to if we can do it by September to the next year's school plan. And uh, education, Christian-based education, changes communities, and that's uh, we're seeing that happen. So. All right, let me share from God's Word. I had some thoughts um, here. In fact, a, a question that immediately I, I, I think about a lot because of what I do. And as I, as I go into churches, and in whatever direction this, I, I answer this question, and it's how do we accomplish missions? How do we fulfill the Great Commission? And you know, missions doesn't start in Haiti. It starts right here at Orkville for you. And in fact, Acts 1 8, you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That means home. And then to everywhere else. And so how do we how do we accomplish that? How do we fulfill that? And along with that question, the other day I had a pastor friend of mine, and in fact he was asking me to come and share. And he, he had this question, and I was a little taken back by the question because I I don't know, that's not something I really think about. But you could apply it to overall life, you could apply it to the world, to the United States, you could apply it to just personally today, but how to survive the end of the world. And it's like, well, I don't, I don't know what the end of the world really looks like other than what we read about in the Bible, but sometimes you ever get to the place you feel like you've reached the end of the world. I mean, it's like, 
I, I don't know what else to do. I mean, it's just not feeling good. Things are just not on track. And how do we survive that? And, and then, I, I just don't know about the word survive because I personally, Pastor, don't feel that we're really called to survive. We're just called to go. We're just called to do. And I mean, I don't have time to really validate all that from God's word. But when we hear the word survive, by definition, it means this. To remain alive, to carry on despite hardships, to persevere. Okay, I, I can validate that in God's word. And we need to be people that persevere through difficulties, through hardships. And in fact, the very word survive, you guys have been there, it describes, totally describes the people of Amy. They have learned, in spite of everything else, in spite of the lack of food, of income, of jobs, or, and their health issues, whatever it is, the people of Amy have learned how to survive. I mean, they survive day by day. And so, okay, I thought, well, how do we survive the end of the world? How do we survive in the midst of our difficulties and struggles or wherever the world overall is? And as we look at survive in light of being a believer, I believe Christ himself defined it in this scripture, Luke 9, verses 23 and 24. And he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. See, I, I believe as a believer, to survive is to die. To survive is to die. To die with Christ, to die to sin. So my opinion to truly survive the end of the world is this. And this would be, if we wanted a title and you need a title, the title of the sermon is, Live Like We Are Dying. This is how missions happen. Is, this is how ministry happens. This is how we touch and affect the community that we live in, whether it's here in Workville or all the way to Haiti, wherever it is, even in our own homes, is to learn how to live like we are dying. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 10 through 12. Through suffering, Jesus. I mean, if you just read that for the first time, it's like, wow, that's exciting. Uh, but that statement, yes, we live under the constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. But here's the cool part. So that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. Meaning we're literally just giving ourselves up and saying, God, how can you use us? Whatever way that is, I want to be used. And then he wraps it up and says, so we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. And so if we can reach a place, and I, we're going to try to define that a little bit of how to really live like we're dying, but, but if we can reach that place, he will, I truly believe we can transform an area, a town, a family, whatever, a country. Paul also said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I think he understood what it meant to live like you're dying. But let me ask this question. If we knew we were literally dying, what would we do different? And maybe, I don't know everyone in this place, so maybe there's someone here that's dealing with that even right now. And, and I'm, I'm sorry for that. I, I, I don't know how I would handle that, but I do believe we would do some things different. We would begin to make some decisions that would go be different from maybe the original plan. But I'm certain... We would feel this sense of urgency. And I, and I could go back and remember the time that my mom passed away. who spent a lifetime in ministry. And how at the, her last hours, the urgency that she felt and she spoke into our lives about we, the three kids, my two sisters and I, to go forward in life and in ministry and fulfill God's calling upon our lives. But I think we would have a change of heart. I think we would have a change of attitude if we were literally facing death. But how many of you, uh, this is a scary question, how many of you are country music fans? All right, the rest of you are probably just not telling the truth, I know, but whatever. Because I, I don't know, is country music that big? I'm from Oklahoma, all right? We get country music, I mean, that's where some of it started, so. But country music fans, there's a song, and I'm sure you've heard it if you haven't, it, it's an incredible song and fits with where we're at today. And it literally is titled, Live Like You're Dying, sung by Tim McGraw. And I am not going to sing it, okay? 
But I, let me share some of the lyrics of this song because I think you can take this and tie it to even what we share from God's Word today. But he goes like this. He said, I was in my early 40s with a lot of life before me when a moment came that stopped me on a dime. And I spent most of the next days looking at the x-rays, talking about the options, talking about sweet time. And I asked him when it sank in that this might really be the real end. How did it hit you when you get that kind of news? What did you do? And then, of course, the, the, the chorus we, we would hear, we know, I went skydiving, I went Rocky Mountain climbing, I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. That would get you close to God. And I loved deeper and I spoke sweeter. And I gained forgiveness I've been denying. I mean, that, that's a sermon right there. I gave forgiveness that I've been denying. And he said, someday I hope you get the chance to live like you're dying. Goes on, he said, I was finally the husband that most of the time I wasn't. And I became a friend a friend would like to have. And I finally read the good book. And I took a good long hard look at what I'd do if I had it all to do again. Like tomorrow was a gift and you've got eternity to think about what would we do? And I really think in, in light of death, yeah, there, there's some, something's going to happen. There's going to be an urgency. But here's the thing. Whether we are facing that or not, I believe we can make the choice to be urgent for God. I believe that's what God is wanting out of us. Does that mean we have to be the best in town, the best witness, the best whatever? No, I just think we need to approach life with an urgency that says, I don't want my neighbor going to hell. I want my neighbor knowing about God. And if we have that kind of urgency together as a church, as a body of Christ, as a community, I know we'll see lives transformed. There's a story of a young man who is very close to me um, <clears throat> named Reuben. And in fact, it's Claudel's half-brother. And uh, see if I can get through this story without busting, because I, I, he, he is dear. He's actually my son-in-law, so and he, I have a grandson, okay? So I wish I had a picture of that, because that would ease the, the tenseness of this, this story. But in the earthquake five years ago, um, Reuben was in Bible school, and a guy that I had really grown close to, a young man, and I had been able to help mentor him, and he, would, he went with me with groups. He was in Bible school at the moment of the earthquake in a class of 68 students. Krista, go, go, because you're going to kill me, all right? She knows who Reuben is, but anyway, I, he was in a, well, there were 68 students in the class. The earthquake hit as it was started rumbling and shaking. They had no clue what was going on. Reuben jumped up to, to run out of the building, just kind of a panic. And a, a larger gentleman, for whatever reason, was running in the door, knocked Reuben down. The moment they fell, the, the building caved in and fell on top of them. And uh, the man upon him died immediately, instantly. And then, and then while they were all under the rubble, not sure who was alive or, or what, there was a girl next to him began to sing, Great is thy faithfulness in Creo. And he was holding her hand. And Reuben says that all through the room, people were singing the song. And then... One by one, they would just die. They would quit. Finally, the girl passed on, and it got really quiet. And I, I share that story to share because in the next few, the next moments of Reuben's life, because he didn't know, out of the 68 students, only 12 came out alive. But over the next three to four hours that he was under that rubble, he said, first I got angry with God. And you know God's a big father. He can handle that. But he said, the next thing, he said, all of a sudden, I realized. Sorry. I realized that, you know, God, I'm alive for a reason. And, and, and by the time he was pulled out of the rubble to where he's at today, he says, I want to be urgent for you. I make fresh commitment. God, you saved me for a purpose, now let me fulfill it. And he tells how that in those moments, he went from being a maybe believer he, he knew he was, but it was just kind of come to church because it's Sunday mentality. Instead of coming with, with an urgency, coming with expectation and leaving here with a dream and a goal to change the world, that's what happened. 
And I know that that's happened to many people over the years, but in, in, in Reuben's case, his life was changed because he faced death in the face. And he came out of there choosing to live like you were dying. For the most part, for us, that urgency, I mean, I, I, I hope I never face anything like that. I hope none of you ever face anything like that. That urgency has to be a choice. We choose. We may never face death. I hope I go out of here in a fiery chariot, all right? I, don't, I, just, I just want it to be exciting. I don't want to face death. That's just human. But at the same time today, I need to choose to be urgent for God so that I can affect my neighbor or the person in the store in town. So no matter where we are in life, whether we're 10 years old or we're 90 or we're sick or we're healthy, it doesn't matter. We must choose to be urgent. Our text verses says, verses 10 and 11, through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. Question, how is Jesus evident in us? Well, as we look at to live like you're dying, there are some basic principles in God's Word in no way. I mean, as I put these thoughts together, this thing's becoming a book, all right? Just, just, just going through this or became a book as I was writing these thoughts out. But there are some basic principles that I think to live like we're dying that we need to apply to our life. To love, to serve, to give, to believe, uh, to walk in faith. And all of these are vital. But I want to begin just quickly. I want to talk about a couple of them. But the one I really want us to focus on is what the Bible says is really the most important out of these characteristics. And that's love. To love. And we can apply it love like you're dying. I truly believe if we live like we're dying and we become urgent for God then one of the things we have to do is we have to love like we're dying. We have to love like it's our last moment on earth. Because whatever we are, whatever we're not, whatever gifts we have or we don't have, ever how smart we are or not, love can affect the world. Love can affect your home, our, our home, our, our world, our community. It needs Christians walking in love. And we can look at a lot of different verses to establish the importance of love, but really none better than Jesus' answer to this question. In Matthew 22, verses 35 through 40, and it says, An expert in religious law, an attorney if you will, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, very simply, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. You know, being a Christian is not that difficult. It's not that hard. Now, now trust me, there are times we make it difficult. And I understand difficult. I grew up in a very conservative world where everything was a sin but eating when I grew up. I mean, it was just everything. I remember those days. I ran my first track meet in the fourth grade in jeans because I couldn't wear shorts. I mean, a lot of those things have changed. I understand that, and I thank God for it. And I do even thank God for the upbringing. But Christianity is not that difficult. He didn't tell me not to wear shorts. He told me to love God and love my neighbor. If I can focus there, God will show me what He needs, where He needs me to go and what kind of life that He needs for me to live. It's just not that difficult. And I think love helps take the difficulty out of being a believer. You might say, but I don't know what to say to my neighbor. I don't know what to say to my friend or even a family member or whoever. Don't say anything. Just love them. Love them in Jesus' name and eventually the conversation will get there. I mean, there might be moments if somebody's on their deathbed and they don't know God that you need to say something. But for the most part, if I love my neighbor, there's going to be effect. I'm going to be able to be a witness to that individual. And so the love is so important. But the first great commandment that, that Jesus mentions was to love God. Love God with all 
our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because...
and strength. And how do we love God? Now, everything we're talking about, we could do a series on all of them, so I'm going to buzz through them a little bit quick, but how do we love God? We do it through worship. Psalm 45, 11, because He is your Lord, worship Him. And, and there's tons of other, other scriptures with that. We worship Him with praise. We sing songs in here this morning to lift up God, to lift up the name of Jesus, to exalt Him. And that's vital. But we also do it through acts of service. So it's one thing to come in here on a, on a Sunday and sing praise and listen to someone share. But we have to also worship Him in acts of service. Romans 12, 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly, the writer said, this is truly the way to worship Him. So to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind causes life transformation to happen. It's what missions is all about. It's what ministry is all about. So we live like we're dying. We love like we're dying. But to live out these biblical principles and to live out love, I think it helps us to serve better. That's important. It helps us to give more. That's vital. Ministry, missions doesn't go forward without the giving. And it helps us to believe more intently, to truly walk by faith. Hebrews 11, verse 6, and without faith it is impossible to please God. And you know, there's uh, the Lebec story, in fact, might be uh, a good story to look at. The housing project, the MOH 500, after the earthquake, uh, you know, you know ministry, and in fact, without faith, ministry is just can get kind of boring if we're not careful. Faith is such a key part. But right after the earthquake, there was 1.5 million people that were displaced out of Port-au-Prince, and they, they left the city, and probably half of them came our direction. And so there was people all over the place, just in tents and makeshift houses and, and just living on the ground. And we there were there was a group of temporary houses or tents that were set up in the area where we secured the land. The government gave us this 100 acres to build the houses on it. We presented our plan to the government. They liked it. They accepted it. We started the project. We, we didn't have one dollar in the bank to build houses. And we said, God, we're going to start and we're going to walk down this path. Now, you've got to show up. You've got to do something here. And immediately, immediately, and we had a guy from Texas. His name is Bill. And here's how fun going around the U.S. is. I shared in a living room about Mission of Hope. Claudel and I went into a living room and we shared about Mission of Hope. Claudel saying there were probably 20, 30 people in there and we had good old Southern Baptists. It was a Southern Baptist group of finger food that night. As I was sharing, there's a, a big guy just standing in the back. Didn't say a word. Even didn't say much afterward. But I saw tears coming down his eyes. He found out later he owns a fence company and the cable systems across the U.S. He's done about a third of those. And he, I mean, he just did. He, you know, he dressed like a, a farmer. I, did, I had no clue. That guy, that very guy, a couple of years later, gave enough to build the first 200 homes immediately when we set on the project. That's how faith operates. It, maybe you don't get it. And by the way, if you do the math, 200 homes at $5,000 a home, that's more money than I have in my bank account. All right, so just so you know, it, it, it's an amazing gift. And it was then we were able to just move forward as individuals would purchase a home to be built. But it's faith. You know, love keeps all biblical principles on track. Faith keeps it exciting. Faith keeps it exciting. And I, and I, I preach to Mission of Hope staff all the time. Folks, if we're not walking in this by faith. If we're just going in it by what we see in front of us, and hey, then God's going to be limited. But when you turn God loose into your life, my life, the church's life, the mission, whatever, God does big things. He changes lives, but He uses us, and it takes love to do it. So the first commandment was to love God. The second great commandment, He said, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, it's easy to love God. Sometimes it can be a challenge. I may be speaking just to me in here. Maybe the rest of you... I've found times it was a little bit of a challenge to love my neighbor. 
because they didn't always treat me right. I don't know if anybody's ever been mistreated by somebody, but you know what? He even told us to love our enemies. Sometimes like, God, what are you telling us? This is difficult stuff. But here's why Jesus said that this command was as equally as important as loving God. That's what the Word said. And so it's vital that we love our neighbor. Who is our neighbor? I once heard it defined. I believe it. I, I accept this. That it is anyone, especially those who are in need, no matter who they are or what they have done. Wow, that's a big open door. But to love our neighbor. In Luke's account of the same conversation concerning these two great commandments, Jesus was asked a second question. Luke 10, 29. The man wanted to justify his actions, the attorney that we had already read about, wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered with the story of the Good Samaritan. Then he probably wished he hadn't have asked. The story, verses 30 through 33, is very simply, you know the story of a man who was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, was attacked, and left on the side of the road for dead. Religious people came by, they even walked to the other side of the road. The Samaritan, a known enemy, came by, and the scripture says, he felt compassion. I think we need to choose today, we need to learn, if we don't know how, to feel compassion for the needs around us, even if we're not always in agreement with who or what they do, who they are or what they do. Compassion defined is the deep awareness of the suffering of another accompanied by the wish to do something about it. It's not just a feeling. It's wanting to make a difference, wanting to do something about it. I know you come to a place like Haiti and, and you're going to feel that. It's going to be easy. But wow, what if we learn to feel compassion? right here in Hortonville. Now, I, I was once asked this question, how many needs do you drive by to get to your religious events? I know that's an unfair question. That's totally unfair. But I've thought of that, I've thought of that so many years now, that question comes back. How many needs are sitting out here? Wait, I can't help you, I need to get here. That's what happened in the story. We need to become like the Samaritan and say, I feel compassion, and I'm going to do something about it. And even as we look at that, the, the, the last words of that in the story of the Good Samaritan, and I want to read those, verse, those verses, 34 through 37, Luke 10, because there's a statement at the end that I want you to get a hold of. Before I read that, let me just say, how do you survive the end of the world? How do you survive the mess? How do you survive what you're facing right now? The challenge, the difficulties of life. We all have it. It's all there. It's life. It's just, it's just going to happen. How do we do missions? How do we do ministry? How do we fulfill the Great Commission? And as we read this and then come to that last statement, I think it gives us a glimpse of how we can truly make a difference. Luke 10, 34 through 37. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. His bill runs higher than this. I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said these words, yes now, go and do the same. Pretty simple. It's not always easy, but it's pretty simple to understand what it takes to literally be what God has called each of us to be. Whatever that is, there's a calling on your life, there's a calling on your family, there's a calling on this church, uh, here in this community, to affect and to bring life transformation to others. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for this church. I thank you for Pastor Dave and Jerry and their leadership and God, their, their passion to see people come to you. And Father, I just pray that across this, this room that uh, you'll minister to every heart, every life. God, help us all to reach that place of urgency to truly live like we're dying. Not because we're literally facing death, Father, but because if we make that choice, then we can truly become what you've called us to be. 
we will have the urgency to reach the world around us, whatever that is. God, let us have effect on families and friends and people in this area and then people in other parts of the world if that's where you would lead us. God, very few in this room is ever going to get called outside of this community, but this community needs more of you. We all do. And Father, I just pray that you'll fill our hearts with compassion so when we come in contact with the need, we'll not only feel it, but we'll want to do something about it. God, I thank you for that. And I give you praise because I believe, Father, that in that, you'll pull us out of that survival mode into victory mode. And we go forward for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All of our hearts, souls.